Each day is like heaven. My heart overflows. No longer I serve him. The sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him. The sweeter. Thank you, Mr. Don and Miss Lisa. It's a great message in that song. They, I'll just be honest. Are they, are they coming around? They may be leaving, so I can say something about them. Um, <laughs> they are such an encouragement, aren't they? Um, you know, as a younger pastor, I, uh, I always joke with them, I'm going to want to be like you when I grow up. And uh, such a great encouragement to us. All right. Um, Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. This is uh, basically the third of a a short series within the book, uh, or within the Sermon on the Mount, dealing with marriage. Uh, We we set the, on Mother's Day, we set the tone for these next two services when we looked at Genesis and God's plan for marriage. Last week, we looked at... Uh, lust and adultery are, are really adultery and how lust undergirds a lot of that. And then this week we look at divorce, okay? Now, uh, just I'm just going to ask you to just uh, graciously and patiently and honestly, let's just look at what God's Word says about it. It's a sensitive issue, all right? I started, started working uh, several months ago. I spent... Um, I don't know, about 10 hours in a library just at, at a seminary just going through, just trying to, trying to deal with this in a biblical way, in an honest way, because this is a, this is a complicated topic in, in our world, okay? And so we're going to look at it. Anybody know what the average cost of a wedding was in 2021? Nobody wants to take a stab at that. The average cost, who said what? You were right on, $28,000. Pray for me, I have three daughters, all right? Uh, this week, uh, actually just a couple days ago, I was, in, I was in Hattiesburg. I stopped at a, a stoplight, and I looked to the right, and there's one of these, uh, it was a, a big red uh, bus bench. with. It was painted with an advertisement on it, and the advertisement said, no fault divorce, 600 bucks. $28,000 for a wedding, 600 bucks to get out of it. So it seems it's far more expensive to get married than to stay married. Now, please understand, it's always going to cost more to stay married because it's work. Okay? Let me just, let me just set that stage first. And so, again, I, I realize that talking about divorce is an incredibly difficult and it's a complex issue to properly deal with. Additionally, I know that just like last week when we looked at the concept of adultery, I know that many of us in this room have been touched at some level with the issue of divorce. I know it's a real thing that we have to deal with because it's, it's something that we, we see. And so either you've been, you've been possibly divorced yourself or it's, it's touched your family or it's touched your children or it's touched your parents or whatever. I'm just going to ask us all just to, to patiently walk through these two verses, connect it with some other things that Jesus said about the topic, and let's just look at the big picture of what Jesus would have for us. I promise we're going we're gonna to look at it with wisdom. We're going to do our best to walk through it with grace. Uh, but we also really have to wrestle with it because Jesus spoke about it. Jesus gave us the teaching that we need to understand about it. So just because it's complicated or it's raw or it's emotional doesn't mean we should not look at it and try our best to understand what the Bible would say about it. And so with that in mind, let's, let's pray before we, we get started. Lord, uh, be with us as we, we deal with this topic, God. We're, we're so thankful that you've given us your word and that you've, you've blessed us with families 
And God, I know that marriage is difficult. God, families are difficult. God, it is, it is hard to try our best to live with one another and to love and to serve one another and to, uh, to raise children with one another. But God, I just pray that as we, we look at what you say about, uh, about this, God, that we would just submit our hearts to yours and we would try to be more like the people you would have us to be. And it's in your name that we ask these things. Amen. Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32 says, and this is the words of Jesus now, he says, And it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman also, or excuse me, woman commits adultery. Even in Jesus' day, Divorce was a contentious topic. It's always been a contentious topic. If you were to go back to the history of this day, there were two major rabbinic uh, schools of thought. Now, rabbis were the major teachers, okay, and there were two different groups, really. One was named Hillel and one was named Shammai, and they both had different opinions on what this, uh, or they both had different teachings regarding divorce. Rabbi Shammai took Deuteronomy 24, and we're going to get, we'll get to there in a second. He took 24-1, uh, Deuteronomy 24-1, as the sole ground of divorce being some sort of super grave offense. On, and on Rabbi Hillel, on the other hand, had a very lax view on it that basically interpreted it to the most broad uh, uh, understanding so that any trivial offense on, a, on behalf of a wife was a divorceable offense. You burnt his dinner, you could write a certificate of divorce, okay? Uh, if he just thought, you know what, this girl over here is prettier than you, certificate of divorce. So you had a rigid view, and you had a completely uh, open-ended view. We still do, ten we still are pretty much there today, aren't we? We're generally super, super rigid or open-ended. We're still looking at things the same way thousands of years later. But the Pharisees seemed, ironically, to like the open-ended view. Surprise, surprise. They wanted to be justified in anything they did. And so, and we'll, we'll look at that in a second later on in Matthew when they come to Jesus and they ask the question, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Because that was the understanding of the day. In other words, in this contemporary debate, debate in Jesus' day, they wanted to know, where do you, what do you think, Jesus? Are you strict or are you lax? And in the background is Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. I'm going to read it for you. Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. This is the, the baseline for the question that Jesus is dealing with. And this is what Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4 says. When a man takes a wife and marries her... If then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house and she departs out of his house and if she goes and becomes another man's wife and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is, is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Now, in Deuteronomy 24, this bill of divorce is a new thing from Moses. Okay? What it really served as, it served as protection for the woman. If the woman had no rights, and she didn't, the woman had no conceivable way to, 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 to provide for herself financially, and she didn't, okay? And if a man could just divorce her anytime he felt like it, she was left out in the cold with no help. And so a worthless husband could drive her from his own house, and afterward, he claimed that she still was his wife. Whenever, so he could even change it. He could kick her out and then bring her back at his own whim. And so Moses comes in and says, here is a way to deal with this. You need to literally end the marriage. 
with a real documented uh, piece of paper that would offer her protection. It was accepted in this time that in throughout the Jewish world that a, a man was entirely entitled to divorce his wife. A wife was not per- permitted to divorce her husband, but he could do it anytime he saw fit. So the husband's right was regarded as inalienable, and the only question was really, what was his basis for doing so? So this, in Deuteronomy 24, was Moses' effort to stop easy divorce. This was Moses' effort at stopping a no-fault divorce on behalf of the man. This legal certificate kept, his, kept him from treating his wife poorly, and it protected her from abuse. The scribes and the Pharisees, though, were using it as a free pass to divorce any time they saw fit. Now, I don't know about you, but that tends to be what we do. We tend to look for as much leeway to justify anything we want to do, and we look for good reasons to justify what it is that we do. And they were taking what Moses had given them as a way of protection, and they were still using it to be abusive, basically, towards their women, towards their their wives. Now, I want to start off by saying something real quickly about Deuteronomy 24. The Bible neither condones that practice, nor does it condemn it. It states it as a matter of fact. Moses just says, Y'all are still dealing with divorce, so we need to make it a little bit easier. Not easier as in easier to do, but we need to make it better, rather. That's what I should have said. We should have made it an easier thing for the woman to be protected. Because he knew that still, even then, just like today, marriages are tough and things are going to happen. And there are going to be some things that are going to happen that some people aren't going to work towards to fix. And so he was trying to offer a, a, an avenue of protection for the, for the woman. And so this was really the, the, the issue here. Now, if you were to scoot over to Matthew 19, I'm going to encourage you to do that. Right? Go over to Matthew chapter 19. Right? Jesus is going to d- again deal with this concept and this issue of divorce. It's Matthew 19. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9. Okay? Starting in verse 1 says, Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, He went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, Have you not read, He who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh." What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So again, Jesus here is addressing the certificate of divorce mapped out all the way back in Deuteronomy 24. However, according to verse 8 here in Matthew 19, Jesus is teaching that even the permission, even the allowance here for divorce made by Moses was given because men were not willing to do what God's word said. That was it. Why does Moses allow this? According to Jesus, because of the hardness of their own hearts. In other words, divorce was allowed then, even in the worst cases, out of our hard hearts. Again, we we get to the issue really in almost every section of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus comes and he deals with our hearts. Jesus is always concerned with our hearts. Is he concerned with our actions? Absolutely. But before he gets to our actions... He starts with our hearts. In verse 32, Jesus shifts the conversation. But I say to you, that's in Matthew 5, sorry. But I say to you, places the declaration of what Jesus is saying against what Moses allowed in Deuteronomy. 
But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Sexual immorality here has been translated a lot of different ways. Fornication, lewd conduct, it's a, it's a big term. It's actually, in the Greek, it's the word porneia, where we even get the word pornography. It's just this, this open-ended, junk drawer term that puts all sorts of sexual sins in one big category. Jesus says, anyone divorcing someone other than the sexual sin, most likely adultery in the first place, would make someone commit adultery. Well, that begs the question, well, how does that make someone commit adultery? Well, because just like we said last week, it was just expected that people were going to be married. Even if someone was going to get a divorce, the expectation was that that person would still go out and get remarried. So it only commits adultery in that way because he was expecting that people were going to remarry. So what is Jesus saying here? Essentially, if you can look at Matthew 5 and Matthew 19, Jesus is saying what we already know. Quite simply, marriage is intended to be an exclusive one-on-one relationship for life. There is no other way for us to look and consider marriage. It is between one man, one woman, and it is intended to be for life. Okay, we just have to start there. That is the standard in which God has given us from Genesis to Revelation. Okay? Additionally, he's saying here that the the excuse, the, 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 the proper excuse for violating that principle of one woman and one man for life was basically through ongoing unrepented adultery or sexual sin at some level. That's the the, the justification Jesus gives. Now, even here, Jesus never commands divorce in this case. Rather, he permits it. If all attempts of reconciliation have been exhausted in this case, Jesus gives permission. The Bible gives permission here because that breaks the covenant, the covenantal aspect of sexual exclusivity within marriage. The one flesh has now been broken at some level. So Jesus allows it here in case of sexual sin within the marriage covenant, even if he doesn't necessarily um, encourage it. Jesus is not encouraging divorce. He's allowing it. So very carefully, let us look at what Jesus wants us to know here about divorce. Well, Jesus, again, he comes in and he's dealing with their hearts. And that's so very, very important. So I want to give us three main points to think about, about Jesus' teaching here on divorce. And just one thing for us to consider, right? Three main points and one thing to consider. And all this connects back to what he says in Matthew 19. The first principle is this. The Pharisees were preoccupied with proper grounds for divorce, but Jesus is far more concerned about the sanctity of marriage. Even today, when we're dealing with divorce, we need to focus more on the sanctity of marriage rather than what's permissible for divorce. That's the big picture. We need to reclaim the sanctity of marriage. It's a good thing that God has blessed us with. Is it difficult? Yes. Is it hard? Absolutely. But is it worth it? Most definitely. Because God has blessed the covenant there. So when we talk about divorce, we need to focus not so much on divorce, but on the goodness and the sanctity of marriage. The Pharisees' question was just given to Jesus on what he considered legitimate grounds for divorce. Jesus flips it upside down on them. It says, what is it like in the beginning? He created male, female, and put them together forever. That's the way it was in the beginning because later on he says what? In the beginning it was not so. There was a time when there was no marital strife. But then sin entered into the picture and fractured everything we've all been dealing with it ever since. They were looking for easy outs in which to get divorced. Therefore, Jesus' reply wasn't really a a reply. He basically asked a counter question, right? He refers them back to Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 creates male and female. Genesis 2, he creates marriage. He says, what does the Bible say about it? That's really what he says. 
So the biblical definition here of marriage implies that it is exclusive, one woman, one man, and it is permanent. That's why they cleave or to be joined, right? That's permanent. And these two aspects of marriage is what Jesus is focusing on. Therefore, marriage, according to Jesus, is just this beautiful divine institution that he's given us, which God makes permanently one, two different people who leave their parents in order to be married. Jesus cares about marriage. So in no case is divorce ever promoted or commended. Marriage truly is to be intended for life. Right? We just need, we have to, I understand that it's sensitive, but that really is God's standard for us. That really is. That's really what God wants out of it. That's really what God wants for us. Because marriage is a sacred gift from God designed to showcase his glory. It's meant to showcase his grace. And indeed, it's a weighty thing to contemplate getting, getting out of this covenant, right? I understand that. But in, it is really for this reason that the grounds for permissible divorce in Scripture is very, very limited. Secondly, the Pharisees called Moses' provision for divorce a command, but Jesus calls it a concession. It's very important. The Pharisees responded to Jesus by asking, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? They said, since he said it, it was his command to do so, but they're really missing the point altogether. They saw permission as a command to do whatever they wanted to do. And folks, we kind of do some of the same things in our own life, don't we? Not just in this issue, but just in general. We do this all of the time. We must be very careful. A careful reading of Deuteronomy 24 reveals something different. Look, this is, I'm going to kind of paraphrase. It says, after a man is married a wife, if he finds indecency, if he gives her a divorce certificate and divorces her, if she marries again, if her second husband does this, if then, like there's all of these if and then. It's not like go do this. It just says there's a long lot of things that must have to happen for this to really be the way it is. So what's Jesus getting at here? Well, Jesus is saying that the reason divorce was allowed was the same reason that the, that the Pharisees are looking for other ways to do it, the hardness of their heart. Divorce was not in God's original intent. Neither was it an instruction. It was just simply a concession because of our own human sinfulness and weakness. So can we be honest? Look, we're all weak, right? And nothing can make us weaker than marriage. Nothing can make us stronger than marriage, but it makes us weak. You put two sinful people together and say, live together, share life together. And if God blesses you, then he allows you to multi multiply yourself in kids that act just like you do, right? It is hard, right? All sin, divorce included, stems from our own hardness of heart. All sin is, is, comes from the same root. Divorce is no different than any other sin. It's not something that we should seek to be sure, but it's not different. Therefore, guess what? It's forgivable, just like any other sin. It's not the aim, right? But a person is not a leper because they've been divorced. In fact, there are permissions in Scripture for divorce. So if the Bible says there are permissions for it, we should not, on our own, add more limitations on that. Because the Bible gives permission for some of this. Adultery is one. Abandonment is another. That's in 1 Corinthians 7. Paul deals with that. And I'm going to say this kind of like Paul. I'm saying this, not the Lord. But I think abuse is also in that category, okay? Uh, and that's a sermon for another day. I can make my case biblically on this because I think it violates the marriage covenant, okay? So hear me out, ladies. If you're in an abusive marriage, you need help. I'm going to speak for myself, but I believe all my deacons will back me up. We will help you get out of that as soon as possible, okay? That is something that we have to take very seriously here. If there's kids involved, you need help, we will walk with you through that, okay? And if you 
disagree with me on that, you're more than welcome to come have a conversation with me. And I'll show you how you're wrong. Okay? We are going to protect women and children here. Okay? We have not, denominationally wide, have not done this well, and we will do that well. That's another point. But here's the good news. God is gracious and can forgive even that. Just because adultery happens or abuse happens doesn't mean that God in his good gracious, graciousness and in his, excuse me, and in his love doesn't mean that God can't forgive that and redeem that and restore that. God's grace can fix any brokenness in marriage. It really can, okay? So, third, the Pharisees regarded divorce lightly. Jesus took it seriously. We have to take it seriously. It's not something we want to look for. It's not something we want to walk towards. It's not something we ever should even talk about lightly because Jesus knew it was serious. It's not unforgivable. It can be allowable, but it should never be the goal. And then lastly, I want us to consider one thing as a side note regarding what Jesus says here. If you were to jump over to Ephesians 5 as we close Ephesians 5, 25 and following, Paul deals with some of this. And he says, husbands, love your wives. How? As Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Jesus gives us the singular example of how marriage is supposed to function. Marriages are supposed to function as a visible example of God's grace. Now, Jesus tells us that infidelity is a valid reason for divorce, but it doesn't have to be. Abandonment, again, according to Paul, is a valid reason for divorce, but it it doesn't have, have to be. How can we get to the point where divorce is no longer an issue for us to deal with? Well, we must walk in grace with our spouses. That's what we have to do. Man, we are called to love our wives like Jesus loves us. How does Jesus love us? All the way to the cross. All the way to death. That's how he loves us. That's how we are called to love our wives. Jesus didn't fight for his rights, but for his Father's will. So husbands, if if we will walk in grace and love our wife this way, we'll fight for them, we'll honor them, we'll protect them. Wives, if you respect your husbands, as Ephesians 5 says, the way we're supposed to respect the Lord, your marriage will be stronger. Men, when you love your wife the way Jesus loves us, your wife will obviously respect that. Both have a part to play in this. This is important. Now, aren't you glad that Jesus loves us in such a way that he acted on our behalf? Think about that. That his love for us made him act for our benefit and our good. And so I know every marriage is different because everybody is different. Every person is different. But listen to me here. We want to have strong marriages here at Corinth Baptist Church. We want to have strong families And whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you're a widow, whether you're divorced, whether you're looking, whether you want to stay single the rest of your life, doesn't matter. God wants the best for all of us because he loves us and he cares for us. And if we'll walk in faith and we'll be gracious and we'll be forgiving and we'll seek the Father's will for our life, God will honor this within us in our own circumstances and situations no matter where they are. So, our lives, not just our marriages, our lives will only be as strong as our walk with the Lord. Well, that's it. You know, so, so, in closing, you know, again, I realize this is a difficult topic to, to deal with. And again, I know it has touched many people in this room. Let us remember that God is good and gracious towards all of us. Let us not be a church that adds more and more regulations and looks so legalistically at everything that we ourselves don't extend grace to others that may have had things happen to them that were difficult. Okay? Let us protect one another. 
And I'm really talking about men. Let us protect the women in our church. Let's protect the children in our church. Okay? I think that's a God-honoring thing that we must do. Okay? So maybe this morning, the point for you, maybe divorce doesn't necessarily deal with you, but this does. Every one of us at some level need to get our hearts right before the Lord. All sin, it's big, small, indifferent, no matter how you look at sin, no matter how, how I look at it, all sin stems from hardness of heart. And if you have a hard heart, you're going to struggle with sin. You're just going to struggle with sin differently than the way other people struggle with it. So maybe this morning, you're in this position where you need to get your heart right with the Lord. Second, maybe this morning you need to get your heart right with your spouse. Maybe you need to forgive. Maybe you need to repent. Maybe you need to offer forgiveness. Maybe you're in a position where you're dealing with the ramifications for divorce and you've got bitterness and pain and hurt. Maybe you need to extend forgiveness too and realize that you may have been sinned against. That's a real thing that we've got to deal with. But whatever it is that you need to do, my point is, Jesus cares about our heart. And he cares about your heart in particular this morning. So no matter how this issue has touched you, pained you, my encouragement for all of you is to realize Jesus loves you and he's got a plan for you. And he wants to offer grace and forgiveness because that's who Jesus is. But if we walk with a hard heart, being okay with our own hardness of heart, we're never going to walk in grace. And we're never going to be able to encourage or to encounter what Jesus would have for us. So this morning, folks, I just encourage all of us, let's repent of our hard-heartedness and walk in the grace that God wants to offer. Let's, free, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your plan. God, thank you for our families and uh, our marriages and the kids we have, God, and the families that you've blessed us with, God. But we just want, we want our church to, well, we, not just our church, we want all of our churches just to be places where family is uh, uh, blessed and honored and treasured and valued. Uh, but we also know that sometimes we have to ask difficult questions and we have to do difficult things in order to be the people you've called us to be, God. So I pray for all of us here that we'll be willing to deal with our hardness of heart, God, that we'll walk in grace, God, that we'll seek your obedience, God, that we'll seek your will in our life, God. But whatever you would have us to do here just this morning, God, even in this moment, I pray that you would allow us to be obedient. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. If you would stand as we sing with him. 544, have thine own way, Lord.